Hi everyone, in this video I will show you how to use code first migrations with Entity Framework Core. I will also cover many different functionalities related to migrations like seeding data, using separate classes, reverting migrations, creating scripts, adding a custom code to the migrations and executing migrations from a separate project assembly. As you can see, there is a lot to cover, so let's get started. So, I have prepared a project with a database model containing entity and a context class. Also, you can see the connection string prepared. Of course, for this to work, I must have the entity framework core package installed. Now, to register our database context with the service provider and also enable migrations to recognize the context class, I have to install this SQL Server library. And then I have to modify the program class. So let's use the service property and call the addDB context method with the provided name of the context class. Also, as an action delegate argument, I will call the use SQL Server method. For this one, I had to install the Microsoft Entity Framework Core SQL library, provide the connection string from the app settings file using the get connection string method and add a key from that section. Now, before I start with the first migration, I have to install Microsoft Entity Framework Core.tools library to support migrations in our application. So, with the package installed, let's create our first migration by executing the add migration command with the migration name. And as you can see, we have our first migration created. But what really happens behind the scenes? After we execute the add migration command, EF Core does several things behind the scenes to prepare our migration. The first thing it does is inspecting our context class, associated entity classes, in this case only the student class, and any configuration we applied. After that, it creates three different files in the migrations folder. The repository context model snapshot file holds the model of the database and it is updated every time a new migration is added. The other two files, initial migration and initial migration designer, are files that contain and describe the newly created migration. So let's inspect the initial migration file. This file has two methods named up and down. The up method consists of commands that will be executed when I apply this migration. As an opposite action, the down method will execute commands when I remove this migration. In this case, it will just drop this created table. So, after I have my migration files, I have to apply them for changes to take effect in the database. And to do that, Let's execute the update database command. As a result, I will have a database created with two tables. In addition to the student table, we have another created table, EF Migrations History. EF Core uses this table to track all the applied migrations. So, this means if we create another migration in our code and apply it, EF Core will apply only the newly created migration. It does that by storing the unique ID in the mentioned table, which is the same as the file name created with the migration. Now, I also use code first migrations in our Ultimate ASP.NET Core Web API book, which you can find linked in the description below. Feel free to check out the book if you want to master all the best practices to create powerful and production ready web APIs. And also, check out our Blazor course to create client C-sharp apps without using JavaScript. Again, links are in the description below. Ok, so let's continue. I have already explained the purpose of the up and down methods in our initial migration file. But all the code in these methods is generated by Entity Framework Core. If needed, we can add our custom code too. So, let's modify the up method by using the migration builder object and calling the SQL method where I pass the create procedure command with the name of the procedure. 
and the select statement as the procedure's body. Of course, I have to modify the down method by using the same object and the same method, but this time I pass a drop procedure command. We should make sure to have the SQL method in the down method to execute the opposite actions if we decide to remove the migration. Now I will delete the database just to simulate the initial state of the SQL server and this time only apply migration. And as you can see, the procedure was created. Excellent. Let's move on. Right now, our model and context classes are in the main project together with the migration files. But in many real life projects, models and context classes are in separate projects. For such projects, executing migrations couldn't be possible with the setup we have in our project. So let me show you what I mean. I have already restructured the project. And as you can see, I have three projects the main one, the entities, and the repository. You can also see the packages installed in each project. In the Entities project, I have my models, and in the Repository project, I have the context class. And finally, in the main project, you can still see our previous migration. Now, I can try to add another migration. But I get an error message that explains that our project doesn't match our migration's assembly repository. This error message is great because it provides us with an explanation of how to solve our problem. All I have to do is modify the program class by pointing the migration assembly to the main project. So, to do that, I will add another action delegate here and call the migrations assembly method to provide the name of the main assembly in my app. And that's all I have to do. Now I can run the same command again, but this time it executes successfully. We can see the migration file has no code in the up and down methods, and this is normal because I only created an empty migration. Of course, I don't need this file, so let's see how I can remove this migration. The process is pretty simple because all I have to do is use the remove migration command. And as you can see, the migration file is removed. I can also confirm that by checking the migrations folder. Excellent. Now we can move on. In most projects, we want some initial data in the created database. So as soon as we executed the migration, we want to populate the database with some initial data. This action is called data seeding. To seed some data, we first need to override the onModelCreating method in the context file. Here, I can modify this method by using the model builder object, calling the entity method with the student type, and calling the hasData method where I can provide all the students' data I want to seed. But I will stop here with this implementation. This method of seeding data can be fine if we have only one or two models we want to seed. But usually, in the real world projects, we have a lot more data to seed. Using this approach, our code can become pretty hard to read and maintain. On the other hand, EFCore provides a better way of creating a fluent API configuration by using the iEntityTypeConfigurationT interface. With it, we can divide the configuration for each entity into separate configuration classes. So, let's see how to do that. In the repository project, I will create a new class and name it Student Configuration. This class must inherit from the iEntityTypeConfiguration interface with the student type provided. And let's simply implement the interface. Now, inside the configure method, I can use the builder parameter and call the hasData method to provide all the data I want to seed. So, let's just paste the data here. You can see I provide the data for three different students and this data is placed only in this single class related to the student entity. All I have to do now is to modify the onModelCreating method. 
I will use the model builder parameter and call the apply configuration method to apply configuration from the student configuration class. And that's all. Clean and easy. I can now add a new migration name student seed and apply it as well. You can see from the logs that all the data has been inserted inside the database. Also, if I check the migration table in the database, I can find a new row added with the name of my new migration file. Great, and let's move on. Let's see how we can automate the process of applying our migrations as soon as our app starts. To do that, I will start by creating another class in the main project and name it Migration Manager. I need a static class here because I will create an extension method to start all the migrations at the application startup. With the class created, I need a new static method here that returns web application. Let's name it Migrate Database and I will extend the web application type here named Web App. Inside this method, I will add a using directive and create a scope with the services.createScope method. I can use this scope to resolve different scope services. Next, in another using directive, let's create the app context variable and use the scope with the service provider property to fetch the repository context service with the get required service method. Now, I can add a simple try catch block and inside the try block, use the app context variable and call the database property to execute the migrate method. This method will apply all the pending migrations for the current context. In the catch block, I will do nothing special for now. You can add your custom handling logic here. Lastly, I will return the web app object. So this class is ready and the next step is to call this method in the program class. To show how this automatic migration works, let's add another object in the student configuration class. Then I will create a new migration named another student. And now I can simply start the app. As you can see from the logs, this new migration has been applied. Awesome. But now, what if I made a mistake with this migration and want, for example, to modify the code inside the migration file? Well, I can revert it by using the update database command and specifying the name of the previous migration. And as you can see from the logs, the latest added student was removed from the database. Also, the latest row was removed from the EF migrations history table. But with this, I didn't remove the migration file. I just reverted the migration. So this means as soon as I start the app, the new migration will be applied again. Finally, if I want to make an SQL script for all the migrations, I can do that by executing the script migration command. This command will create a script file for me. Great. So, with all this covered, I can finish the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again in another one. Until then, all the best.